You know, you don't have to go to too many places nowadays to say something, to get a conversation going about uh, our country's in, in sad shape. But the truth of the matter is our world is truly in sad shape. And uh, Chicago just elected a new mayor. And the lady that was mayor before her wanted to defund the police. Uh, she was very progressive. Uh, she's destroying Chicago. Well, so they had a chance. And they elected one even further to the left and more progressive than her. He wants to do away with the police. You know, they don't have enough trouble there as it is, so we're going to get rid of the police. But, 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 we got some really good social programs we're going to put in the worst places to help fix the crime problem. <laughs> By the way, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. We do have an answer. If you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Now, believe it or not, this is an Easter message in Corinthians. Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The key verse is 18, but we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. We're going to end, read chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Then we have two other quick little scriptures, and, and that's the service. That's going to be it, okay? Hopefully, we should be through within an hour and 20, 30 minutes. So if we get out here in 30 or 40 minutes, hey, y'all have got a bonus today, you know what I mean? And don't tell me about your chickens and your eggs and all the supper that you're going to eat in a little while. It'll wait. You know, that's, that's one of the good things I found out. <clears throat> Just to change the subject from... Have y'all heard of Tulsa time? Tulsa? Tulsa time. Well, we call Hewlin time around here. You know, Hewlin's always run late. All right, uh... <laughs> we run late. I run late. How's that? But I tell Leanne, she always freaks out about funerals and weddings and stuff. I'm the preacher. That wedding or funeral is not going to start till I get there. So if I'm late, it's okay. So if we get out of here a little late, it's okay. If we get out early, that's okay. Uh, anyway, seriously, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's look at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto those which are saved it is the power of God. Let's stop right there. Like I said, that's the key verse. Here... <laughs> Social programs don't fix the problem. Uh, in all honesty, police don't fix the problem. They protect the, the honest, but it doesn't fix the problem. All right? I hate to tell you, we've watered the cross down so much, we think it's a political party. We think if you're on the right, the conservative side, the Republican side, then that's going to fix the problem. Let me tell you, there's as much corruption in the Republican right as it is in the liberal left. All right, that's just the honest truth. How do you fix this situation then? We all need to vote. 
Look, this is what we really need to do. You want to hear it? We need to pray. We need to pray. And turn our focus to the cross. But see, what does it say about the cross here? For the preaching of the cross to them that perish, it's foolishness. So when you go and tell any of our government leaders, when they're saying, let's ban the guns, that's the problem, the guns problem. Look, I've got guns that's never shot nobody. The gun's not the problem. It's the fool that picks the gun up. All right? It's like a car. You want to talk about a weapon? How many people could you wipe out with a car? I know a man. I had to ride with him in a truck once. He killed 13 people in Texas with his tractor trailer. How he ever got his license again, I don't know. Why my boss hired him. To ride with me on that one trip, I'll have no idea. And he could actually drive a truck pretty good, but he killed 13 people. He'd been drinking, and he was moving his truck in the truck stop. Okay? He wasn't driving down the road. He was just going to move to a parking spot, but he'd been drinking. And he drove through the truck stop and killed those people. It doesn't take guns and stuff. So what are you trying to teach us, Skip? I'm trying to show you... That all this stuff that they call wisdom, what we got to do to fix all these problems, is, is false. The truth is, what we need to fix the problems is to preach the cross. Not a watered-down version. It's the bloody, nasty truth that sin is filthy. And God sent His Son, who died on the cross and shed His blood, was beaten and stabbed, just put to shame. He died. He was buried and he was resurrected. Now that's the gospel of the cross that has to be preached. He loved us so much that he sent his son to do that so that we might be justified. So let's read about us fine folks here. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Amen. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. I watch preachers, and I, I look at some of them, and I think, man, if you knew how stupid you look. That's why I don't watch those videos that we make at this service. I don't want to think of the same of myself. Uh, but, you know, it is foolishness. When you stop to really think about what we're trying to preach in the worldly standard, it is foolishness. Our Savior is a man that came, and instead of cleaning house, he humbled himself to the Father's will and allowed himself to be crucified. Look, I, I want to let you know he was all man and all God. But what does that tell us? It tells us that nobody, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. He didn't want to die. Why do you think he, he anguished so that he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane? Leaving his people that he loved he didn't want to leave them. But he still humbled himself and followed the Father's will, thank God. For after that, the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. See, that's what happened. Uh, what's that saying you say, Donnie, uh, that your dad used to say about uh, the, the educated fools? They become educated fools. We, we've got so educated, we deny God. You know, oh, no, no. It was a big bang. You know, millions of years ago, billions of years ago, when there was no physical matter, when there was nothing, all of a sudden something happened. Well, there's a guy that sings a song later that says, nothing from nothing leaves. So nothing from nothing together is, my Bible says in the beginning, God. Well, can you explain God in the beginning? God? No, I, I, 
That's by faith. I just have to take it by faith. But the other religion is nothing, 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 all of a sudden something. Well, what takes more faith, that or in the beginning God? I would say nothing to nothing takes a lot more faith than just saying God. My, my confidence is in God. So we could go back to this foolishness. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Really? He was crucified? So your Savior died? Well, that didn't help you out much, did it? Yeah, well, actually it did. Yes, it, it, it did. He paid for my sin. But unto them which are called, verse 24, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, underline that part, the power of God, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, you're calling, brethren. Now, who's he talking to? Us. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You just insulted us. <clears throat> well, don't forget, he calls us preachers that preach the gospel, foolishness, the foolishness of preaching. For you see your calling, brethren, verse 26, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. We're going to stop there. We're going to do a parenthetical insert here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> maybe. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And let's look at verse 6. This was, uh, Samuel was a prophet of God. He knew the first king of Israel, uh, Saul. His reign was coming to an end. He's going to anoint a new king. God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. He had eight sons. One of them was David. He had eight sons. Seven of them showed up for the ceremonial uh, anointing. Let's pick up and see what it says. Now, Samuel was really upset because he knew that he was fixing to pick a new king, and, and he didn't approve of Saul, but he, he loved Saul, and Saul was his king, and he didn't want to change but anyway, and it came to pass in verse 6, 16, 6 of 1 Samuel. It came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. The Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so 8, 9, and 10. 10, uh, they're going through, and then we'll read 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thou children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Well, send and fetch him, uh, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent him and brought him in. Now, now he was... Ruddy, I didn't look that word up, I, I've heard it taught, I don't remember. And withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. He was handsome. Really not one that you would think as a, a warrior king, one to lead the people. Uh, more probably of a, maybe leaning towards the feminine side a little bit, even though he was a shepherd. Really a fine young man, and not really very big. His other brothers would look like a king. Look, you know. And God told Samuel, don't look at this. I know who I have. Now think about what all that David ended up doing as king. The good things, the bad things. 
But he was a king for the people, but most importantly, a king for God. He was a, God, a man after God's own heart. You can't go by what you see. So when we're looking at appearances, sometimes we look and... I saw some old pictures. Man, that cross has been hanging here for a long time. Uh, we really don't like talking about the cross. We want to lift up this beautiful Christ and say, God is love. Uh, we don't want to look at the power of the cross. God in the flesh, hung by mankind. Any of y'all watch the movie The Passion? Anybody see that movie? That was a hard movie to watch. I don't believe I could treat an animal like that, much less a human being, much less one that really did nothing to me. Those people hated him. All he did was come to die for us on that cross. And because he died, they had to put him in the ground. They buried him. That's where he should have stayed. If he had stayed there, we'd all be in a bad shape. Now see, y'all all that saved can agree with that because this is not foolishness to you. But see, we have to remind ourselves of this sometimes because he does call us to do uh, good works, but the good works is not what saves us. What he did is what saves us. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. We're going to pick up in verse 28. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh shall glory in his presence. Please underline that in your Bibles. Because a lot of times we act as if God uh, scores us on a, a, a grading curve. And so we compare ourselves to others in our church, in our community, in our country. We talked about this a little bit in, in Sunday school. When we went to India, we had people come and, that walked over three days to hear me preach. Y'all can laugh. That's funny, ain't it? We can't get people to drive five minutes in an air-conditioned and heat and heated car. We even have heated seats and heated steering wheels now, right? And air-conditioned seats. And I don't guess they've made a refrigerated steering wheel yet except for in the winter. But uh, we find it too uncomfortable to hear the message of the cross, don't we? We don't want to hear that. Tell us that if... If we're kind of good people and we trust in Jesus, then good things happen to us. And that's all we, the more good that we do, the more good we got. Well, that's not always the case. Matter of fact, in India, the right people find out you're a Christian, they'll kill you. You'll be lucky if they just beat you half to death. Huh. Would you have your faith then? Would you keep your faith? Or would you deny Christ? That no flesh should glory in His presence. It's not. Matter of fact, I'm going to make a little note there. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. That's, that's how that's supposed to be. But of Him are you in Christ Jesus of God, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness and sanctification set apart in redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The only glory we have is of God. When you get to the truth of the matter, without Christ, we're base. Without Christ, we're demented. Without Christ, we're deserving of death. 
Actually, that's the beginning of your salvation when you realize there's nothing that you can do to save yourself. When you surrender. I know, I know, without a doubt. My salvation rests on nothing but what Jesus did. It has nothing to do with my confession. It has nothing to do with how I live my life. It has nothing to do where I go to church. It has nothing to do with my baptism. It has everything to do with what Christ did. And if that is not sufficient, then I needn't worry about where I'll go when I die. Because if that's, if that's not sufficient, I will go to hell. That's why I trust fully in Jesus Christ, because I know that it is He that has saved me. I was not even seeking Him when I got the call from Him, okay? It's He that seeks you out. You can sit in the church, but if He's not whispering on you, I remember Brother John would preach sometimes, and it felt like my heart was going to explode. I thought Donnie had been going talking to John about me. And God was just using a man to preach the gospel of Christ to get my attention to answer the call that I heard back when I was 10. Just a quick reminder, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You're not worthy to glory in the presence of God Almighty and his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Neither am I. No flesh. No flesh. <clears throat> Verse 31. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 1 of chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, this is Paul speaking, came not with excellently of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of, of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. It's not good preaching that gets you saved. It's not good teaching. It's not good doctrine. It's not good theology. It's not study, study, study and make sure you know everything because you'll never know enough. Paul says, I didn't come here to, to show out. He says, I came that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What you need is the power of God. So let's finish up. Here's your, your last scripture. Turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Luke 23, verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors one on the right hand and one on the left, another on the left. Then said, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he parted his raiment and cast lots, and the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Stop right there. When I was a child and I'd hear a teacher or a preacher read this, I'm gonna, I want to do a survey here. I thought, yes, why didn't, why didn't he do something right? He had the power. He had just been healing people. Why did he not just stop this? How many of y'all thought that when y'all was first? Good. I'm glad I'm not told. 
I know why now. Y'all do too, right? Because if he did, we'd be doomed. How many times do you make what you think is big sacrifices for your children or your grandchildren? That's nothing compared to what God did for us. That's nothing what Christ did for us. You know? It wasn't the nails. Y'all have heard that saying, right? Kind of. It wasn't the nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for us. Verse 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and others. But the other one answered. Now, Matthew and Mark, if you go back and read the, their accounts, both of them was chiding Christ, you know. And, uh, but the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know, I heard Alistair Beggs talk about this. He says, One of the first people I want to go and, and, and look up when I get there is that man. So how did you manage that? You never did go to church. You wouldn't baptize. And he tells the story, and I'm going to try to do it. That thief, he shows up. St. Peter's at the gate, right? He says, what makes you think you can just waltz in here? He says, uh, what's the, do you understand the, the full concept of justification by faith? I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, let's go straight to the Scriptures. You understand the inerrancy of, of the Scriptures. He says, hang on, let me go get a supervisor to come in here. And, and uh, the angel came up, one of the archangels, and says, well, what should we do? To, why should we allow you in here? What makes you worthy to come in here? He said, the man on the middle cross, said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I'm worthy. It's the power cross that saves. And when you try to mix, I've talked about this and this has always got my attention. My cousin asked one person that I led to the Lord, how they knew they were going to go to heaven. He said, well, Brother Skip baptized me. Here, let me tell you something else. If you answer it, this is what Alistair Begg said, if you answered in the first person, I accepted Christ. I asked Christ. He says, you've already lost the point. You have to answer it in the third person. How do you know that you say, because Christ on the cross was crucified, buried, and resurrected. He's my redemption. It's Christ. What's your answer? I've tried to teach this to you. Everything, your answer is the cross. And I'm not talking about this piece of wood here, cross. I'm not talking about the gold cross that hangs on your neck. I'm not talking about a tattoo that you have on you that's got a cross. I'm talking about God in the flesh hanging on a cross over 2,000 years ago, willingly gave his life, shedding his blood to cover your sins, my sins. What's the answer to society's problem? Christ. Christ. You know, if we all would believe and have the faith that we were supposed to have in Jesus Christ, we wouldn't need any armies. We wouldn't need any police. Life would be really good if we would submit to the cross. You know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? 
Have you surrendered to him? There's no part, partly surrendered. Either you're truly saved or you're truly lost. Let's get this real straight. And nobody knows except for you and God. Okay? We can all act fools or we can all act like saints. But only God knows if you rend your heart to him. John, if you'll come up and lead us in a song of invitation. Y'all know God is speaking to you what you need to do. If all you need to do is stand and sing and praise God, then by all means, please stand and praise God. If you need to come and repent uh, for things that you didn't do or things that you did, when I say didn't do, you know, we, we talked about that in Sunday school too. There's times that God asks us to do things and we don't do it. If God's asked you to do something, you don't do it, that's sin. And sometimes I think that sin is worse than the sins of commission because we, we get some of our life in order, but we won't surrender the part that he's asking for. All right, so what? He says, quit drinking. I quit drinking. Quit smoking. I quit smoking. I quit cussing. So, kind of. And, you know, <laughs> he says, go do this. Oh, I don't want to do that. They might think I'm a fool. I look like a fool doing that. Don't make me do that. I don't want to do that. You going to argue with God? Our time is short. The answer to this planet is Jesus Christ. I don't know if the whole world will get hold of it before he comes back. But my worry is not for the whole world, but for you that sits in front of me and myself. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, would you like for him to be? Only you can answer that. Stand to your feet, Brother Johnny. I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I tried. Oh, Coming